Well, go ahead, turn in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. While you flip there, let's do a quick review, a quick review. Here's the overarching big picture of what we're doing in Matthew's gospel. We are learning how Jesus is a king. We're learning more about his kingdom. We're taking the theme of king and kingdom, and we're also taking the theme of discipleship, two very prominent themes in Matthew's gospel, and we are bringing them together to learn how we can be disciples in his kingdom who go live for his kingdom. Now, I think as we come to this very popular passage on salt and light, we also need to do a quick review of where we've been. In Matthew chapter 3, we saw Jesus baptized. We saw the Holy Spirit come upon Jesus, empower him for ministry, empower him as Pastor Brad wonderfully preached to go resist Satan. And then in the second half of chapter 4, we saw this movement just erupt as Jesus withdrew to Galilee, did ministry there. The man preached, the man taught. The preaching and teaching were accompanied by signs and wonders, authenticating that this is God's son, this is the Messiah. And now there's a crowd. There is a crowd from all over Israel. There are new disciples. They need to be taught. They need to be trained. They need to know who they are. They need to know more about who their king is and what it means to follow him. So what did Jesus do? He sat down on a mountain and taught them and taught them. And what's the first thing that he taught them? Where have we been the last three weeks? He taught them that they're blessed. He taught them the path of blessedness. All those blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And today, as we learn about salt and light, here's what we learn. We have been blessed in Christ, and now we take that blessing out as his salt and as his light. Can I tell you the story of a man, a man I know who does a wonderful job of being salt and light? His name is Larry Thede. He lives up on the north side. He goes to Lakeview Presbyterian. He's up there in the hills, Vernon Hills area. Larry is one of the godliest men I know. As I work with this man in our regional group of churches called a presbytery, I have come to love Larry, respect Larry, and hope I'm like Larry when I'm 75, 80 years old, which is where Larry is at. That's his age. Larry has a huge heart for the Lord. I've seen it as he and I work and labor to connect missionaries and church planters with the 21 churches in our regional group of churches. I've seen Larry live as salt and light. How does Larry live as salt and light? Let me tell you how this 75, 80 year old man lives as salt and light. Larry is retired and sometimes has to walk with a cane. But do you know what Larry does with his retirement? Do you know how he invests it? Anybody guessing Florida? Larry's like, Psh, Florida? Try Africa. Try Africa. In the summer months, in the springtime months, Larry and his wife travel through Africa, going to places like Gambia, Rwanda, Zimbabwe, teaching future, future pastors, training them, teaching them the book of Revelation, teaching them how to disciple, how to lead Bible studies, laying down the biblical foundations of Christian belief. Larry is an amazing man. In fact, let me show you a picture of Larry. It's kind of grainy, but do you see that? And do you see the cane? Oh, this is a man who challenges me. Here's a story from one of Larry's travels. He sends us emails, we get updates. Here, here's an update from Larry. He says, one day I was prompted to start the day with a skit. 75 year old man doing skits, that's impressive. That's patience. Starting the day with a skit as a way of reviewing our new identity in Jesus. It was about an American coming to adopt a child from an orphanage. The ladies all lined up hoping to be chosen, the characters in the play hoping to be chosen, except that one of the characters was the naughty one. And of course, she's the one who gets picked. Why? Because they're trying to illustrate through this skit our adoption in Christ, that we are chosen in Christ before the foundations of the earth, not of anything that we have done, no, but only out of his love. As Larry did this skit, the lady who was the naughty one, he talked to her, who played the naughty one, he talked to her later, and what did he find out? She had been severely abused as a child. She was in an abusive marriage and had to be rescued from it. God used that very skit through that woman's teary eyes to work in her heart in a deeper way to show her just how much he loves her and just how much she belongs to him as a good father and belongs to Jesus as a good husband. Is that powerful? 
Here's another story. As the women were practicing sharing the gospel in pairs, one of the women realized, oh, I'm sinful. No, no, I really am sinful. She had never thought of herself as that bad of a sinner, but she related to Larry's wife's testimony in such a way that she actually came to faith in Jesus right there on the spot while learning how to share the gospel with other people. There was much rejoicing. Another woman shared that after hearing how important from Larry's wife it is to hug your children, the wife leads Bible studies on families, she went home that first day and hugged her children for the first time. She got home on that second day, hugged her children again, and her kids looked up her and said with that big, beautiful African smile, Mommy, God is doing something new in your heart. Brothers and sisters, friends and guests, I don't know about you, but I want a legacy like Larry's. I want to live like that. I want to be remembered that way. I want to be salt. I want to be light. And I know so many of you do too. We should all aspire to this in some way, even if we never make it to an exotic place like Africa or are called to missions in Hawaii or Fiji or the south of France or something like that, right? We are salt. We are light. In fact, let's hear that in our text. Go with me. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. This is God's holy, inspired, inerrant and infallible word, picking it up in verse 13. You are, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Verse 14, you are, you hear that? You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Here at Grace, we say, this is the word of the Lord. And you say, and it is written for us in love given to us for our good. Let's attend to our Father's voice. This is going to be good. How are we going to break this passage down? Where are we going? If you get lost in the woods and wondering just what it is I'm trying to say and you're confused, here's your lifeline. Here's the two places we are going this morning. The first is this. To be salt and light, you need to see yourself through his eyes instead of your eyes. You need to see yourself through his eyes instead of your eyes. The second thing that we will see this morning is this. You need to engage the world instead of withdrawing. We need to engage the world instead of withdrawing. Let's go. Let's look at that first one. Let's see and explore that we need to see ourselves through his eyes and not ours or another person's. All right, we did this quick review, right? We said in chapter four, the crowds are coming to Jesus. Jesus went around Galilee preaching, healing, casting out demons. But here's what you need to know about this crowd. It's been a while, it's been four weeks, so let's review. This crowd of Galileans, do you remember them? They were the rejects. They were the rejects, they were the half-blooded Jews. They were the second-class citizens. For our younger kids, you might might know this phrase, they were the mudbloods. They were the mudbloods. They were the lame and the deaf that people considered cursed by God. They were the demon possessed that nice polite society kept at arm's length. They were the broken, they were the weak, they were the unwanted, they were the lesser thans, they were the outcasts. They would have been, if you remember that TV show, they would have been on the Bad News Bears or that team from the movie The Sandlot. This is who other people considered them to be. And when you have other people telling you time and time again, this is just who you are, what happens? You internalize it. You start to believe it. You start to believe sooner or later that this is who I am. Isn't that true? And can't it be so cruel? What about you sitting here today? Where are you at? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as fundamentally good? I'm doing just fine. Thank you very much. Do you see yourself as good? How else? Do you see yourself as the powerless one? 
I'm powerless. I'm powerless to stop my hours from dropping. I'm powerless to stop my pay from getting cut this time of year as the cold weather sets in and the work goes away. Do you feel powerless to stop life? Even though it's moving at 1,000 miles per hour, the boss is telling you to pedal harder and your workload, either at work or in the house, just keeps piling on. Do you feel powerless to solve a certain problem in your life or do you have a loved one whose life is falling apart and you feel powerless to help them? Are you here today and do you feel like the powerless one? What about loneliness? Are you here today and are you the lonely one? We have people in our congregation who physically, literally are lonely. They have no one in the home except for themselves. But I also know in talking to you and sitting down with you, we have people who feel relationally lonely, emotionally lonely, spiritually lonely. You can have extended family, you can have a spouse, you can have kids, and you can wonder if anybody really sees you. You can wonder if anyone cares. Does anyone know the struggles that I'm going through? Does anyone know? How my dreams are being broken. Oh, we have people who feel lonely. Are you the wounded one? Are you living life with a limp? Oh, I know we have people here who carry deep wounds. I pray for you. You don't even know it, but there are times where I shed tears for you, and I'm pretty sure Pastor Brad has, and Pastor Patrick will. Your elders do too. Are you the wounded one? Do you carry deep wounds? Most of you, I can see it on your face. I can hear it in your voice. It breaks my heart. No, 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 that there's good news coming. How do you see yourself? Good and doing just fine. Leave me alone. Lonely, wounded, powerless. Is it something else? Is there some other way that you see yourself? Is it some combination of these? Is it a little bit of all of the above? How do you see yourself? Oh, Grace, how do other people see you? How do other people see you? It is so tempting to stitch together the sum of our life and what other people think of us and to make that a Frankenstein composite of who we are. Oh, brothers and sisters, there is good news. Would you like to stop looking at yourself through that lens? Would you, stop, would you like to stop looking at how other people look at you? This is where our text starts off with some really good news. You see, there's a parallelism in this text. Let's take the first part of verse 13 and let's put it together with the first part of verse 14. Oh, friends, go ahead, let's go next slide. Let's put Matthew 13 and 14 up, go. I don't know how that got in there, go. Everybody just look up at the ceiling real quick. Keep going, keep going. Everybody laugh, keep going, keep going. Get to verses 13 and 14. We're going to get there. Last week's sermon is in here somehow. There we go. Let's just stop right there. Look at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Do you see the parallel structure there? Do you see how Jesus starts as salt and then double clicks on it, but calls it light? He changes the metaphor. Do you see the parallelism there? We need to see that. We need to see that. And why do we need to see that? Why does it matter? Because that is a statement of identity. You are. You are. Right? Like, do you hear what Jesus is saying? He is saying, this is who I've made you to be. He does not say become salt. He does not say make yourself light. He says, when you came to faith in me, you were transformed. You received a new heart. I remade you. You were spiritually reborn. You are my light. You are my salt. That is who you are. That is how your Savior sees you. He does not see the powerlessness. He does not see the loneliness. He does not see the wounds. In fact, he's working to heal them. He has transformed them. He has given you a new identity. He has given you your true identity. He's telling you how he sees you through his eyes. You are his salt. I'm going to keep saying it. And you are his light. This is such good news. How is this good news? Oh, how is this good news? Do you know how they got salt in Jesus' day? Do you know anybody hear about how they get salt? Have you heard of the Dead Sea? Like the saltiest body of water on planet Earth? You traveled 20 miles to the Dead Sea, and then you did one of two things. You either hacked chunks of of salt rock out of the Earth, or you collected it from the marshes. 
you dug it out of the ground or you collected it from the marshes, either way, you had to clean off the dirt and the mud and the impurities and oftentimes remove impure minerals that that were mixed in with the salt. Do, Do you hear Jesus's words when he says you are salt? Do you hear what he has done? He's saying, I've come a great distance for you. He's saying, I have labored hard to make you mine. I've dug you out of the earth. He says, I've wiped you off. He says, I will continue to wipe you off. I will continue to make you pure. You are my salt. You see that as good news? What about light? How did you make a light? They didn't have flashlights back then. They didn't have fluorescent bulbs. Back in Jesus's day, you squeezed olives to make olive oil. You got some clay out of the earth and you made a pinch pot, then you break it, you put the olive oil in the pinch pot, you made a wick, you put it in there and you you, you sparked a flint to light it. It was labor intensive to make a light. It took careful crafting. Do you hear Jesus' words when he says, you are the light of the world? Jesus is saying, you are the clay I have personally selected. He says, I've made you a wick, I've made you a pot, I've pressed you, produced olive oil. I have crafted you, I've put care and consideration into you. I have filled you. I have sparked something new in your life and now you shine for me. Jesus is saying, if you are my disciple, I have made you into something new and I will use you. Jesus is saying, if you are my disciple, this is who you are now. No longer see yourself through your own eyes. No longer see yourself through the eyes of others. No longer see yourself through the lens of how other people treat you. Look at me. Look at how I see you. Look at how I treat you. That's who you are. I have made you useful as salt, and I have made you as helpful as light. Oh, Grace, do you hear these words? They're beautiful. Are you receiving his words today? It does not matter if you have been abused. It does not matter how weak you are. It does not matter how your kids turned out. It does not matter who you have lost. It does not matter what regrets you carry. It does not matter if everything you touch turns to gold. It does not matter if everything you touch falls apart. It doesn't matter how much you failed. It doesn't matter how spectacular you are. It does not matter how insignificant you feel. Jesus says, I. I have made you my salt. I have made you my light. Jesus is saying to you today, I have a use for you. I have a purpose for you. This is who I have made you to be. And what's the point of being salt and light? It's that he has chosen you. He has enlisted you into his service. He's saying you have a place in his kingdom. He's saying you have a role in his kingdom. He's saying what you think of yourself no longer really matters because that's not how God in heaven, God the Father sees you. What others say about you no longer matters. How others treat you no longer matters. He has made you as useful as salt. He has made you as helpful as light. Oh, Grace, the first thing we see here, and we keep double clicking on it, we're gonna bold font and underline it, is this. The first thing we learn is that we need to see ourselves through his eyes and not our own, nor the eyes of others. But it's not just enough to say that you are salt and you are light if you are here today and in Christ Jesus. We gotta keep unpacking that, don't we? We have to explore that. Okay, what does that mean? How do I live? Let's go to our second point. Let's actually make this practical. You see, our second point is this. To be salt and to be light, you have to engage the world instead of withdrawing. You have to engage the world instead of withdrawing. All right, so we've seen that we need to see ourselves through Jesus's eyes. We're no longer the sum of our good parts minus our bad parts. We're no longer the sum of our opinions, the sum of other people's opinions. We are salt, we are light, we are useful, we are helpful, and we need to be. But how are we to be useful? How are we to be helpful? I've got a busy life, Pastor John. You really wanna lay that on me? We need help. We need hope. Let's unpack this. Look at verses 14 and 15. Look at verses 13 with 14, 15, and 16 again. It's really kind of on the surface. You don't have to dig deep to see the point. Look at verse 13. As salt, we are to bring flavor and taste to this world. Look at verse 14. As light, we can't hide. 
We can't hide. We have to go forward. We have to engage. We cannot withdraw. Look at verse 15. You see it again. Our light fills the whole house of the earth. And can I say this? Can I say this? We can't just be light to a room in the house that's full of Christians and Christians only. Look at verse 16. Our light is to be put on display so that God may be glorified. What's that mean? He may be revealed. He may be made known. His goodness, his love, his grace, his forgiveness, and his mercy may be made known. This is a call to engage. Grace, in short, we have to engage with this world. We can't go seasoning salt with more salt. We can't go shining light on light that's already light. We have to get out there. We have to engage. Let's think about this a little bit more. Let's think about this a little bit more. Let's start with salt, right? Like you have to sprinkle salt on something else, on like a foreign substance to get flavor. Let me put it this way. Who likes ribeye? It's the best form of steak that there is. It's the best meal you'll ever eat. It's a ribeye, right? You have to sprinkle salt on a ribeye and put it on the heat of a grill to get that salt, mix in with those juices so you get that nice, salty, buttery pop. Know what I'm talking about? Anybody want to go home right now? <laughs> Let's grill, right? All right, how about this? You have to engage salt with the crispy, crunchy surface of a French fry. You have to mix salt with brown sugar, vanilla, a hint of almond extract, butter, and to make cookie dough. Do you like to eat cookie dough? Oh, I can't wait for it to get out of the oven. Just give me a spoon. I'll go to town right there. Don't care if the egg has salmonella, right? Salt has to engage with other substances. We as salt have to be stirred in. We have to be sprinkled on. We have to be mixed in to create taste, to create flavor. We've got to engage, Grace. It's the same thing with light, right? Like you don't need light. You don't need a flashlight when the sun is out. You need it at night when it's dark, right? We don't need heat from light in the summer months. We need it now as it's getting cooler, especially if you're like me, I'm born in Florida, right? That's when we need the heat that light produces. We are his salt of the earth. We are his light of the world. To be his salt, to be his light, we must engage. We must add flavor. We must engage the darkness. We must engage the cold and bring the salt and the light there. But how? Oh, how? How do we do this? How do we do this? Oh, Grace Church, let's hit time out real quick. It is such a joy to pastor this church. It is such a joy to be here. I know Pastor Brad would feel the same way. Pastor Patrick's experiencing this and going to grow in it. And why is it a joy to pastor this church? It is because in our sit-downs, our face-to-faces, our phone calls, our texts, our emails, I feel like I know you. I feel like I know you. I know that on the one hand, so many of you just want to serve Jesus. You want to live a life pleasing to him. You want to make him proud, right? Like deep down, you already want to be salt and light. You don't need me to tell you that. But on the other hand, on the other hand, oh, a lot of you have a lot of life coming at you. As we talk, oh, there's a lot of life coming at you. Life is busy and the holidays only make it busier. Life can fall apart. Someone else's life that you love can fall apart and you feel the weight. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody feel that? So here's the question. Here's what I think most of you are asking. How do I be salt and light while I feel the burdens and the busyness and the weight? How do we do this? Is there grace for me? I think there is. I don't think there is. I know there is. Here's four ways you can go engage as salt and light. Let's briefly cover four ways you can be salt and light when you see who you really are. Here's number one. What's the first way to engage as salt and light? The first way is this. Remember the multiple uses of salt. I'm going to hone in mainly on salt right now. Forgive me if you're on team light, but I just think the salt metaphor is so rich. Number one, remember the multiple uses of salt. When you remember all the different ways they use salt in Jesus's day, you will see this. I need to be a blessing. I need to live to be a blessing, all right? In the busyness of life, it helps to remember that salt had multiple uses. What are they? There's like nine of them that I found this week. I'm going to give you four. Number one, salt was a preservative. 
There were no refrigerators in Jesus' day, so when you cooked meat, got the veggies in from the farm, you had to put lots of salt on them to preserve them. Salt's a preservative. What's number two? Number two is this, salt was a healing agent. Salt has anti-inflammatory and antibacterial properties, so you rubbed it in a wound even though it hurt. If you had an open wound, maybe after a battle, it would kill the bacteria. Salt's a healing agent. Third, salt is a cleansing agent. I do not mean to be graphic, but since we had a baptism, let's just use how salt was used as a cleansing agent. When there was a newborn baby, when it was just fresh out of the womb. Their equivalent of a doula or a midwife would take that little baby and gently rub salt to clean the baby off and then present it to mom and dad. Salt was a cleansing agent, a healing agent, it's a preservative. Fourth, salt was used in fertilizer. You can laugh at this one. It helped plants grow. You put salt on, I'll just go ahead and say it, the manure pile helped it break down the nutrients loosen up more, the plants grow better. Those are some uses of salt. Do you see how useful salt was? I've only given you four of the nine. There are so many other ways we could get into, but salt had a variety of purposes. What's the point? What's the point? The point is this. Just as there were multiple uses of salt, there are multiple ways you and I can be salt and light in this world. I mean, think about it. If we act as a preservative and guard against societal decay, if we act as a healing agent and bring people to sources of physical and spiritual healing, if we act as cleansing agents and bring people to the spiritual cleansing found in the gospel, if we act as a fertilizer that help other people grow and flourish and thrive, we are engaging this world as salt and light. Now that's a lot. Do I expect you to remember all of that? No, let's simplify it. Let's take all those uses of salt, let's draw a circle around them, and let's put one word, one concept over it. It's blessing. You see that? Does that make sense? Blessing. If you remember the multiple uses of salt, you will see, oh, I need to go live as a blessing. I need my radar up, seeing how in the workplace, in the home, at the grocery store, wherever I find myself, how can I bring blessing? How can I see needs and in compassion go meet those needs so other people will say, oh wow, that was such a blessing to me. This is actually something that holds this passage together. Pastor Patrick noted this on Tuesday night. He said, when you read that they were supposed to be a city on a hill, you have to go back to the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic promise, where God promised Abraham that you will become a great nation. I will bless those who bless you, and in you the nations of the earth shall be blessed. We need to live to be a blessing. That's number one. Number one. All right. Number one, we need to live to be a blessing. Teach your kids that. Go look for opportunities to bless. Look for opportunities for them to bless other people. As you seek to be a blessing, you will get to share the gospel with another human being. You will get to invite them to community group, church, men's hangout, women's hangout, whatever the case may be. Go be a blessing. When you remember the multiple ways that salt is used, you remember, I can engage as salt and light by striving to be a blessing. That's one. What's number two? Number two, what's the second way to engage? The second way to engage is this. We need to guard against the impurities that would dilute or dissolve our saltiness. We need to guard against the impurities that would dissolve or dilute our saltiness. This passage, let's put it up, verses 13. Uh, yeah, verse 13. Uh, let, let, let's look at this. There is a clear warning that Jesus gives. He says, don't lose your saltiness. I mean, what does this mean? Like, what does Jesus mean when he says, don't lose your saltiness? How does salt lose its saltiness? It's one of the most stable chemical compounds, sodium chloride. It's hard to break them apart. What does Jesus mean, don't lose your saltiness? Here's two possible answers. Here's two possible ways of thinking about this. Do you remember how I said you got salt by digging it out of the earth over by the Dead Sea, or you went to the marshy parts of the Dead Sea, and you got it out, and you had to clean it off? Well, let's think about this. Let's think about this. If you got salt out of the marshes of the sea, there were other minerals in that water that could mix with the salt. It gave that salt a metallic, bitter flavor. Think you could put a penny on your tongue. You know that tang? It's no longer salt. 
It has that flavor, right? Like, do not put copper on my ribeye. No, that's sinful, right? Amen, amen. All right, all right. We don't want to be that coppery taste in other people's mouths. We don't want to be mixed with other things. We don't want to bring sin into the equation. Here's another way. If you wanted to go get salt and you had to dig it out of the ground, what did you have to do? You had to wash the mud, you had to wash the dirt off, and what happens to salt when you pour water on it? It dissolved it, very good, very good. There were hunks of rock caked in with this salt. And if you wash the salt away, those rocks would actually have the white residue. How many of you have seen what I'm talking about? The white chalky residue on the rock. It looked like a salt rock, but did it taste like one? No, don't put it in your mouth, right? It can dissolve away. It can be diluted with other minerals. Either way, the point is clear. These things, this kind of salt, Jesus throws away and he tramples underfoot. Either way, I think there's a really good lesson here. We have to guard against the impurities. We have to guard against letting our salt be dissolved. When we mix our pure salt with sinful minerals, we give off the flavor of the world. It changes the taste. When we dissolve our salt in the waters of idolatry and make good things God things, we may have the appearance of salt, but don't bite in because you're going to chip your tooth. When this happens, we have nothing to offer the world, and we compromise our usefulness to Jesus. So let's keep watch for the impurities that can dilute or dissolve us. What was number one? Number one was this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Remember the multiple uses of salt? Number two is guard against the impurities. What's number three? Number three is this. Don't use too much salt. Don't use too much salt. Look at verse 13 again. Do you see where Jesus speaks of flavor? Out of all of those uses of salt, Jesus hones in on taste. He hones in on flavor. I found that so interesting. I was like, why? Why? And then it hit me. Oh, one explanation could be this. It is possible to put too much salt onto your food. My boys do this at Mexican restaurants all the time. They get the chips, they get the salsa, and the next thing you know, thank you, yes, brother, you feel me. Yes, there is a mountain of salt on the chips. Do I want to eat it? No, it drives mama crazy, it drives me crazy. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? How many of you were like me in middle school where you pulled this really silly, immature prank where your friend went to go talk to a girl, you're at a restaurant, your friend went to go talk to a girl, went out to order more food, went to the bathroom, what did you do? Yeah, 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 you unscrew the salt shaker so that when they come back, and then you all go, ah, and you make fun of them, right? Why is that, you know, I did that with my dad once. I only did it once. I didn't do it again. <laughs> Why? Nobody likes a mountain of salt on their ribeye. Nobody likes a mountain of salt on their chips. No, no, no. Oh, friends, you can put too much salt onto other people. We can do this spiritually. As you seek to be a blessing to other people, can I just say this? You don't have to rub it in their face that you're a Christian. Okay, I have Christian t-shirts, I don't mind wearing them, but you do not lose God's blessing if you don't have enough Christian bumper stickers or t-shirts to wear. You do not lose his blessing. It can be a little in your face for people. It can be too much salt. I don't want to say go remove all your bumper stickers, all right? You do not have to be a Facebook warrior getting into arguments about atheism, creation, or evolution. It's not fruitful, and that other person is probably just trolling you anyways. As we look to be a blessing, you don't have to go around policing other people's language, and you don't have to get so offended when other people sin in more public ways than you do. Friends, these are ways we can spiritually pour out too much salt as we engage with this world. Let me give you another one. How many of you have heard of the bait and switch? Anybody? Anybody know what the bait and switch is? I offer you the bait of something you like, and then, aha, you're going to learn about Jesus. That's a bait and switch. Here's one way you can do a bait and switch, and it's so important. Why? Because on December the 10th, our elders and our building committee are going to present to you the schematics for two different building plans. They're going to give you a rundown of that. 
How could we be salt and light as a building? What if we could have a vision for raising enough money to where we could have an open air pavilion? What if we could find one of those really cool indoor outdoor playgrounds? You know, the ones where you can roll up the windows like a garage door in the summer, put them down in the winter and heat it? What if we could scrape all that black soil sitting on that cornfield right over there? What if we could turn that into a mound, a big old hill where during the snowy months, we could get people together. We could have young kids come and bring their sleds. They could sled down, go to the open air pavilion, get some hot cider, some hot chocolate. They get too cold, they go play on the heated indoor playground or go watch a family movie inside in our main room. Is that a way of being salt? Is that a way of being light to our local community? Yes, I hear you mamas. There are not a lot of parks around here. There's not a lot of good parks. The one good park in St. John across from Suncrest, they have like five parking spots. What if we offered that? But we can't make it a bait and switch, right? Like we can't say, if you come in, you have to go hear Pastor Patrick's gospel presentation, right? We can't, I mean, like we need, don't hear me wrong, right? We have to get to the gospel. It has to be verbally announced. It is news. News is shared. News is shared verbally. You have to call people to faith in Jesus. That's always the end goal. But do we have to do it every single time? Will people keep showing up if that's all that we're known for? Let's seek to be a blessing. Let's build relationships. And let's not over salt it. Think about your driveway during the winter. Is it covered with snow and ice? You put salt on it. You let the light of the sun melt it. Does it take time? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you oversalt it and get pits in your driveway? Yep, made that mistake from Florida. Don't know anything about driveways in the winter months, right? You let it work over time. So it is with the driveway that leads up to the door of the human heart. Let it take time. Don't oversalt it. So remember the multiple uses of salt. Guard against the impurities. Don't use too much salt. Our fourth and final one is this. Here's the fourth and final way to engage. Let your suffering. Let your suffering be salt to another person's suffering. Let your suffering be salt to another person's suffering. I add this because here at Grace, so many of you have come seeking to find a spiritual oasis and you say that you have found it here. As I said at the beginning, I know that many of you feel powerless, wounded, and lonely. You have suffered or you are suffering. For some of you, it's the size of the Grand Canyon. For some of you, it's the size of a ravine at Turkey Run. But here's the thing. Know that the Lord Jesus really will use your suffering as salt. He promises in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, that you will receive comfort in your affliction. Why? So that you can go comfort someone else in their affliction. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Your suffering will be a source of healing for another person's suffering. And what was one of the uses of salt? To heal. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? As God heals you, as he works on you in the midst of your suffering, he says, keep looking at me in the midst of your suffering. Keep looking at me and how I see you. You are still my salt. You are still my light. In fact, suffering is Jesus' way of making you more potent salt and polishing you into a brighter light. What an amazing thing, and we'll close here. Look at verse 13 a final time. Jesus is the one who was salt. Do you see that he attracted so many people to him? Yet he is the one who was salt, but was thrown out and trampled upon at the cross. Then look at verse 15. He was the light of the world who wasn't just put under a basket, He is the light of the world who is extinguished for you and extinguished for me. Jesus has suffered too, and Jesus has suffered for you. Yet it is Jesus' very suffering that has drawn us to him as salt and light. We savor our salvation as the greatest salt we can ever know, and we are drawn to his death and resurrection as the greatest light we could ever know. And if we can be drawn to Jesus in the midst of his suffering, look at verse 16. You really can be his salt and light in the midst of your suffering. You really can shine for him even in your sad circumstances. Grace, this is wonderful news. Let me repeat it to you. How do we live? How do we engage? Remember the multiple uses of salt. Guard against the impurities. Don't use too much salt and let your suffering be salt. Amen.
Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we love you and we praise you. You really are the God of all mercy, the Father of all comfort. And Father, you have made us salt. You have made us light, regardless of our circumstances. Father, may we go out and live for you as salt and light this week. Amen. Amen.